So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Soul Man Surgery here on this Thursday morning. The what are we on? Are we on the 9th of December already? 10th of December, actually. Two weeks till Christmas. Oh, it's exciting. <laughs> um, so we have got our special guest here this morning, which is the lovely June Dixon from Mental Health Kick or Mental Health CIC. Um, and it's a social enterprise that June set up. I'll, I'll let you explain all that anyway, June, but social enterprise that June set up to help people with their mental, emotional well-being. So, June, good morning. Morning, Stephen. It's lovely to see you. Hi, April. Hi, Richard. Um, to see you too. So, so, what is Mental Health Kick, first of all? Well, it's Environmental Health Kick. Yeah, that, I meant yeah. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so... We're a, a lived experience led um, mental health and wellbeing um, social enterprise. Um, and we're really very much focused on first aid for mental health. Um, do you want me to just give you a wee background into how I- Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Social yeah. enterprise up. So, so I've got, um, I've had 30 years experience in the third sector. Um, in various roles, children and families and, and mental health. Um, and yeah, I, I've also got 30 years experience of um, having my own mental health challenges. Um, very much, you know, over the years had a lot of battles with anxiety and depression. But again, this was after some traumatic um, issues and traumatic bereavements. So, you know, I feel that I had kind of got a bit of both. I've got the background in business support management and things, but my own lived experience is, is really, really what um, pushes me um, and makes this my absolute passion. Uh, I was involved in co-facilitating Scottish Mental Health First Aid for quite a while and, you know, I thought that was just a fantastic um, course, very much saw a lot of the benefits, but felt that it was being targeted, and quite rightly, I'm not knocking this, but very much targeted at managers mm -hmm. and almost more the sort of corporate businesses. and. I realised because I worked in the third sector for so long, I just kept thinking, this is just such an amazing resource, would be an amazing resource for volunteers and community practitioners in the community because these are the people who are crossing paths with vulnerable people every day or they get to know people who are vulnerable to... Um, experiencing mental health challenges. Um, so I took huge decision um, two years ago to basically walk away from my career and I wanted to set up a social enterprise and I wanted to be able to offer first aid for mental health to community-based organisations and volunteers because I just think it's such a valuable thing um, for these per particular groups to have. And what struck me with Scottish Mental Health First Aid was, you know, smaller organisations were kind of being priced out the market, but also it was a two day course and a lot of community organisations, they're not just resource poor, they're time poor as well. Um, so yeah, did my research and realized that I could train as a trainer for an off-call nationally recognized qualification. And in that, it was a one day course for first aid for mental health. So yeah, that's it. I thought that's it. This is absolutely what I want to do. Um, on our Facebook page, there is the, the story and it's all around the logo, our logo. And it is a very personal story. Um, 
Yeah, I've read it. It's actually quite an emotional story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's quite emotional reading it. I don't know. Oh. Obviously, it's because that's what you've translated all of that energy into it. So, of course, yeah. it's going to feel that way. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so read it, guys. <laughs> I promise yeah. you'll enjoy it. So, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly summarise. Um, so, after many years of um, experiencing trauma and, as I mentioned, some traumatic bereavements. Um, 23 years ago, my daughter had to lift me out of bath. Um, I had got up in the morning, got in the bath, to get ready like I had been doing for a long time. Um, and I just couldn't get out the bath. I knew that I had to. So I think what happened was I had been far too resilient for far too long. And it was almost my body saying enough now. Um, I was holding down three jobs. I was a single mum to four kids. Um, had experienced quite a lot of trauma, hadn't dealt with any of it. So in a way, you know, that was only going to go one way. And, and our body and brains are amazing. And I think it was just like, you have to stop. So I had many years of cycles of, as I say, anxiety and depression. Um, and only eight years ago, I actually got a complex PTSD diagnosis but I've really learned I've really learned how to live with it I've you know really learned how to almost challenge my challenges um and yeah as a result you know I felt that I brought an awful lot to the roles there was added layers that I've brought to the roles that um I've, I've taken on so First aid for mental health for me, and I also completed Living Life to the Full, a CBT-based course. They were huge light bulb moments in my recovery, massive light bulb moments. Um, and that's why that's what we focus on. Because people like tangible results, don't know, guys, you know, if you well, I'm sure we all know people need tangible results. Well, yeah. I'm telling people I'm the tangible result see when they're they're delivered well when people actually these courses on um I am hugely passionate about first aid for mental health I feel that you know I've campaigned in various roles for mental health to have parity of esteem with physical health so I, I believe first aid for mental health is just as important as emergency first aid. Um, Absolutely. So, so yeah, that's a wee bit of background. Um, as I say, that's, yeah. it's, it's in, in more detail on the Facebook page. I think for me, what's most important is that we've got people like yourself in the community who have, you know, you've lived through those kind of things and, you know, you can, you can relate, you can understand how other people feel rather than people who are just trained to deliver something, you know, yeah. you're passionate about it and it's something that you have experienced yourself. You're much more equipped in my eyes to, to help people through their challenges. Yeah. And I've got a wee question for you from, from what you were um, saying there. Um, so you'd said there were, you know, you, you're about helping people in the community. Um, do you offer your services as well to businesses as well? Oh, yeah. As, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if the fact is us, us working in businesses as well, that, I think it was Richard, you asked if the logo was the head with the tree. We've, we've changed the logo um, and it, it's very, very different now because it, for us, it doesn't matter where you get your first aid for mental health training. 
you will take that in every other environment. That's why we call ourselves environmental health. You get that training at work. You'll take that into your community. You'll take that into your life, just like you do with emergency first aid. Um, and it's so, I mean, the, the business costs of the, the impact of mental health um, is just massive. I think in Scotland, it's 10.7 billion a year. Um, so, yeah, it, in terms of the economic benefit and the benefit to, to the company, and it's early intervention and prevention, first aid for mental health. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a huge, huge issue. And I, and I know that companies are, are all struggling just now, but it's for me, it's a huge investment. If you can make your place of work a safe space for somebody to come to when they're taking a dip, but they know, they know if they, they, they go to work, but they're actually going to get a bit of support and understanding, they're more likely, you know, to come into work because that then becomes a place, a trusty place of support. Um, Sorry, June, do you, know, do you know what's fascinating? And as you say that whilst it's in my head, um, see within our business, I am very much about like, I work for my team. I'm, I'm like underneath them, helping them, supporting them, pushing them up the way. And do you know our, um, our absences in the shop, they're, like ridiculously low yeah um it's something like three percent across three years it's ridiculously low and i think that's just a testament to us in the shop how totally we each other and help each other up i think the only time we've ever had any kind of absence is when it's been acute long term or acute long term you, you know when it's um long term absence through acute health conditions that or unavoidable. That, yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Um, Richard says as well that you mentioned that you're trying to make more, you, you mentioned that you're trying to make it more accessible. So are you aiming for smaller companies? One day training is much more accessible. Yeah, absolutely, Richard. You know, because it, it, again, it's the same thing. It's, it's time resource. You know, I think a one day course really does make it more accessible, especially for smaller organi organizations, businesses, you know, um, to send somebody away for two days. That's, that's, that's a chunky commitment. Um, so absolutely, we'd be delighted to work with smaller companies. And again, it's about us trying to be fluid and flexible. Um, we can deliver the course in various ways. You can have a one day course, you know, please be when we get back into the classroom, which I can't wait, you know, for that face to face. We can do four two hour sessions online. We can do two half days. We really want to work with the organizations, you know, to make it as easy for them um, and yeah, respond to their needs as much as we can. So absolutely. And it leads me on to my next question, because we, we could talk about this for hours, couldn't we? We could be yeah. here for like a whole half a day talking about um, mental health. But yeah. um, why is it so important? Now, I know the question, or I, I think I know the answer, but why do you think it's so important for people to be aware of their own mental health in the workplace or why do you um, think it's important in fact I'll, I'll rephrase that question why do you think it's important for people to be able to recognize in their workforce or in in their daily life when people are not right i think it's hugely important stephen and i think that people that you're working with on a regular basis or as I say, you're supporting. You know, if you're a, a you could be a befriender. Um, 
it's so important to be able to recognize early. The earlier we can recognize somebody's showing signs of distress and the quicker we can get in and just give them that support, mm -hmm. it, the more or the less likely it is that that person will slip into crisis. You know, and for me, that's that's very much what it's about. It's about recognizing things early on because our crisis, our support services, our mental health support services are in crisis themselves. Absolutely. You know, and I feel that with um, First Aid for Mental Health, we can, you know, they talk about, you've heard about the stream, I can't remember the guy who, who actually said, you know, they were, everybody's standing watching the bodies float at the end of the, sorry, the, end of the river. And everybody's freaking out, saying, what, what's going on? Ah, that's me, sorry. Um, what's going on? Um, and nobody's thinking they're going further up the river to see what, what's, you know? So for me, first aid for mental health is us getting a wee bit further up the river. Um, and I'm a huge advocate of early intervention and prevention. I really am. I, I honestly, Stephen, cannot tell you how much I wish. You know, they say don't have regrets in life, and, and I get that, but how much I wished I had the information I have now through First Aid for Mental Health and Living Life to the Full, and I've done lots of other things um, to develop personally and professionally. I so wished I'd had that understanding and knowledge and skills when I was like 14. Yeah. Um, something I find absolutely fascinating and that is um, myself and Susan Watson, we, we are part of the cross party group for mental health strategy. So we go to parliament, we've not been since before COVID, yeah. but um, we get the notes and the minutes from the, the meetings now, but um, we will we will reattend, but basically, what what the the last meeting that we were at, we were um, speaking about how the third sector there is so many amazing people out there doing amazing work, and they could be utilised and used with the right you know it, it needs to be regulated. There needs to be you know. We need to know who's helping, um, but there's so many ama amazing people from the third sector out there that could be used, but right now it's not recognised yeah. by GPs, um, whoever. Um, so Susan and I, when we were speaking at the um, the cross party group for mental health, we were we were very much talking about like how can the third sector help, and it's mm -hmm. been looked at, which is brilliant, you know, because. We're the ones that are working with these guys in the community. We're the first people that they see before yeah. they go and see their GP. People are much more inclined to want to work with people who aren't medically trained, so yeah. to speak. Um, and obviously, I'm not saying for a minute that you know we replace Western medicine at all. No, you know, no, no. But um, we need a balance of both, Stephen. Yeah, yeah. You know, because medication, just medication on its own is, isn't the answer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of third sector organisations and community groups actually offer things that are just so good, so vital for, for your mental health. And the, yeah. the problem is a lot of these guys are finding themselves inadvertently becoming mental health services when they're maybe, you know, it's a gardening project. Mm -hmm. Um, which is incredible, but as I say, our services are in crisis, and I don't think anybody could, could deny that. Therefore, there's more onus on these groups because people aren't getting access to the, the professional help. So it's, you know, it's coming out in other ways, and it's, it's maybe, you know, kids are maybe going to a youth club and youth workers who are amazing and who are fantastically trained are finding themselves dealing more with mental health than actually the activity 
although they go like that, yeah. you know. Um, so I don't think the third sector is utilised the way that it, it could be, but I also think that there, there also needs to be respect and trust built um, yeah. as well. So, yeah, third sector are vitally important and volunteers are, are hugely important. And as I say, I just think, a, an example, I, I did some training at Craig's Farm and the lady who's the cafe manager came to the training and she said, you know, she sees the same people every week, therefore she's going to notice if somebody's appearance, you know, being a bit unkempt or they just don't look right or, you know, because she sees that person regularly, just like a colleague at work. You know, if, if, if you work side by side with someone, you're going to notice because you know that person. Whereas if you've got a workforce and the managers in the office, and that's no disrespect to managers, they, they don't have that continuity almost. Um, so the manager needs the eyes on the floor. Um, and, and I do know, I do know through my work experience that if, if we can get in early and get people the right support, incredible results um, can ensue. So I think the, see that word manager, I would love to just completely abolish that <laughs> because they're not there to manage. They should be called team supporters. <laughs> Um, managers should be the people that are there to help and inspire and you know I think that the the greatest skill of a manager is being able to support their people not to manage people and to you know because I believe that when you manage people people feel managed and they will do they'll, they'll either comply or they'll rebel <laughs> um, so if we can turn that around and we can make it a much more supportive place to work for people then people are going to want to work for their managers you know people yeah. want to work for their business their company whatever it may be um, yeah. and I'm lucky because I've got a team of people that love their job and they want to work for me <laughs> which is great or they want to work for the people yeah. they really want to work for me because I work for them they work for the people and yeah. that's what it should be yeah. I'm, I'm going to go to questions as well, June. Okay, Sorry, I'm like, my so, brain is place. <laughs> so Richard is asking, um, how much of what you teach is prevention and how much is helping people who need mental health assistance? Brilliant question, Richard. It's, it's, it's both, you know, if, if someone um, qualifies as a first aid, first aider for mental health you know what what we're hoping is they're trained to notice things early on and step in but the, but you're also um qualified and trained to support that person to get the right support that they need and engage them um with the right support and again it's we very much put across that's a mix of gp cpn whomever, and other um, services in, in the community that might help. For example, it could be a befriending service um, or engaging them in a local peer support group for whatever you know, their condition is or, or whatever their interests are. So it's very much a, a, a bit of both. Does that make sense? There's a bit of signposting going on there as well for you then when you're working with people, well, you're, you're able yeah. to then... And it's very much about signposting. One thing I really, really want to get across, and I do this in the training as well, is mental health first aiders do not fix people. That's not our job. We're not there to fix the mental health challenge. We're there to 
really start supportive conversations and to guide people and support people. We're a listening, you know, we listen. There's huge value in that. Mm -hmm. And I would say a lot of the time as a mental health first aider, that's what you're doing. Actually, somebody just needs somebody that they can trust and go, Bleh. you know, and in that conversation, if there are things you pick up on and things you, you know, you know, and it might not be a mental health service. It might be the advice shop, you know, it could be the advice shop or citizens advice. There could we be things like that, that you, you're maybe thinking, well, actually, the advice shop might be able to help you with that because in a lot of cases, there's, a, there's stuff going on. There's, you know, the external stuff going on that we don't have a lot of control over. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we are not, that we, we do not fix people. Um, we support people and we empower people to step forward and engage with the appropriate services. And the other thing we do is we very much challenge stigma. Yeah. And I think that's a big part. We spoke about of, that earlier as well, didn't we? Yes. Challenging stigma. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, and I do that. I have no qualms in doing that yeah. because, yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons I'm very, very, um, I'm very open and I'm very upfront about my own story because I feel if I, I'm not, I'm adding to that stigma. Yeah, and it's yeah. not something I'm ashamed of. I'm very, very proud of the fact that, yeah, we've went through all of that. Um, and I like to say, do you know us people with mental health challenges, we're pretty cool people. And we, we, we um, yeah, we, we do a lot in the community. We have a lot to offer and we have a lot to bring. And there's a hell of a lot of us out there in the community um so yeah it's yeah it's not something i think anybody should be ashamed of not at all i think that's the thing i think it's in you know if, if you were to look at 10 15 years ago there's huge stigma attached to mental health it would be like just take a tablet and get on with it but now people are much more likely to want to speak about or to, to feel that they can speak about how they're feeling. Yeah. Um, one, one thing for me, you know, um, I'm very bad at bottling. <laughs> like I bottle up my emotions because I think I need to keep everybody else up there. However, when it's out, when you speak about things, it's like this weight on your weight off your shoulders, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I just said to my wife this morning, I'm really sorry for the last week or so where I've just been bottling things up, you know. Yeah. Um, certainly I've spoke about it. It's, I've just been feeling overly emotional or whatever it may be. Um, but the brilliant thing though, Stephen, is that, yep, yeah, but you've, you've, rec you've recognised it. Yeah. You know, it, the, the issue and the problems come when people just, they don't recognise that. Um, or it's just, there's just no, there's no give up on what's coming from all directions but it's it's recognizing that and I think my my path with my mental health completely changed when I began to understand yeah you know um and and not and bottling it up ain't good there's a the, there's a huge 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 big connection between mind and body as well you know um, something that like, I've known for many years but that whole mind body connection when our mind and our emotional health is the right it then starts to cause dis-ease in our physical yeah. body which then causes disease and you know many many health problems you know so I think a lot of what's going on in people's heads and people's emotional health is very much attached to um, physical conditions as well you know it's like that and that's why we need that parity of esteem between yep. mental health and physical health. And I, my, my mission, Stephen, obviously with a whole load of people's help, is that we have as many 
first, well, mental health first aiders as we have emergency first aiders. You know, and going back to that, really emphasising mental health first aiders are not there to fix the person. And I use the analogy, you know, if you've done emergency first aid and they do the whole CPR thing, you know, somebody's having a heart attack or, or whatever, you're not expected to cut that person open mm -hmm. and, and, you know, do heart surgery. Your job is to preserve life, be there, support the person and get the appropriate people to that person. Mm -hmm. People then whisk them off to hospital and do whatever they've got to do. The, the, the difference is there's a set process in emergency first aid. There isn't with mental health first aid because everybody's unique. Um, and it, yeah. you know, um, and it just the more resources that you know, but it's about feeling comfortable and confident and approaching someone. Yeah. And just saying, look, are you all right? And having that conversation and listening. I think what you're saying there, June, that's so valuable because, you know, if someone breaks their arm or cuts their finger, it's very easy to be able to treat that. But when it comes to someone's mental health and emotional well-being, it's much harder to be able to treat that if you don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. You know? So I think what you're doing is absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm just reading some of the questions. Louise likes to write a little uh, paragraph or two, so I'm trying to read her. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to scroll through the golden nuggets and her stuff there. But um, she, she's taught, she spoke about the NHS there, and she spoke about you know I am not. Please do not think that I am here to poo poo the NHS by any means. All right, um, but it, it fascinates me to, to hear and to speak to so many people that work with the NHS who feel that there's not enough support in a place where it's medically, you know, it's a medical background, you know? The, the, so do you find, because I, I do know that certain people that work for the NHS have got access to support now. And I know that the the HR department with the NHS have done a massive, massive turnaround in helping to support people's emotional well-being. Is that mm -hmm. something that you've came across? Because I know that Louisa said there that she's had a bit of trouble with that when she worked for the NHS. I think I think there has historically been. A, a lot of problems and I think to be fair to them they're, they're probably trying to do what we're all trying to do and yeah. that's understand it and respond it's a huge machine isn't it of course absolutely you know, and you turn that you turn that ship is is much harder and it'll be much slower than you know like my wee canoe yeah um I have to say that my, my wife works for the NHS. Um, she, my wife actually works, I, I don't think I can tell you where she works. Can I, Nikki? Can I tell her where you work? Yes. What's the department? Uh, you do, so it's eating disorder unit. She, she works in the eating disorder oh, unit. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's, it's this, there's huge, 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 um, and Nikki's obviously training to be a mental health nurse as well. So yeah. there's this huge level of support there for the workers in that. That's fantastic. Um, like massive support. And I'm really, really proud to see that. I suppose I might be going off topic a wee bit, but... Um, no, but it is good. And I, I do, I, I, do you know, I think at the moment people feel quite overwhelmed with the whole mental health crisis. And we are being told constantly that, you know, the country's in mental health crisis and it's going to get worse, la la la. I have to say that between what you've said, Stephen, and, and I did a course at St. Margaret's Academy. I was telling, we had a wee chat about it. Um, and it was young adults and you know, they were incredible. And I think, yeah, we've got huge challenges, but things have changed. When I can go to a high school and these kids are, well, young adults, sorry, I wouldn't call them kids to their faces. 
<laughs> that young adults are so clued up, so open, so understanding that, uh, you know, I said to Stephen earlier, I felt that normally there can be quite a brick wall when I'm doing training um, and you're having to break down the discrimination, the misunderstanding, the, you know, the, the stigma. It's, and, and I do, sadly, it's my generation and those older when they come to training who I've got to kind of break that down. There was none of that. And I think that's really positive. And like you say, the NHS, if they're implementing things. So we're think, getting there. Yeah, I, th I, I think... I want to, I just wanted to address what Louise had said there that you know she'd maybe felt unsupported with the NHS, but I do know that now I want to like I just wanted to say that I know that the NHS are doing so much more to help their teams of people, which is great. But also what, what you're talking about with um, the young adults, Richard's asking there, have you noticed a change in the age and the demographic groups that you're seeing requiring signposting? And that's something that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, Richard and I, and that was that um, young people in the workforce, you know, um, from the age of 17 to 25, I think it was, Richard, that we were saying, um, young people in the workforce are finding that, or th they are finding that the younger people are needing more support with their mental health than ever. So yeah. I think yes. that's great. Um, I'll just wait for oh me. no, Richard can he talk? Can he? Because I know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Richard's up to be muted. Um, I think it's sometimes when when demographics change and and there's a rise yeah, in a referrals. Yeah. Sometimes that can be seen as a bad thing. And, it, and I get that it is, but the good thing is, is it a rise or is it that these younger people feel far more confident and comfortable? Oh, June, I love that. <laughs> you know what I mean, though? It, it's, but I am not, I'm not downplaying that young, uh, young people at the moment I don't know how I would have coped at 18 with everything that's going on at the moment. Yeah. You know, young adults who've worked really hard, you know, at school and college and whatever, all the exam thing. Um, and, I, and I think that, that young adults know more and we expect far more of them than what was expected of me at their age. Mm -hmm. You know, they're taking on the world issues and the world problems as well. And then they've got all their social media stuff. But yeah, I think I agree with Richard. I think there has been a real rise. But I try, maybe I'm trying to be the eternal optimist, I don't know. But I think, well, that's good for me that, that young people are stepping forward. It's maybe an indication that stigma has really reduced and that they have the confidence to do that and that they know where to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that helps Richard. I hope that's maybe a wee positive maybe um, in there. But what we need is to make sure that the services are there and that we're not, my concern is for the workers of all these services trying to deal with this influx. Yeah, I, honestly, June, I think that that is something that's very valuable. What you've said there is, is it just a statistic or is it because people are feeling like they can speak, which I, honestly, I think that's gold, absolute gold, um, because we, we're encouraging people to talk more about their mental health. So, of course, we should see huge spikes in people having issues if we if, you know, if, if we're making it much more accessible for people we're going to see that there's going to yeah. be this big spike in it yeah yeah 
it's like, it's like, I've spoke to people of a much older generation than me. Yeah. And I've disclosed my challenge, you know, to much older people in my family. And the reaction wasn't good. It really wasn't. And what you get is, you know, mental health wasn't invented in their day. Mm -hmm. And out of respect, I really bite my tongue because I think, well, you know, when I was a wee girl, lots of people's mums were on Valium. Yeah. So, so I'm sorry that that doesn't marry with that. Mm -hmm. Mental health has always been there and there's always been major issues with it. It's just we're very open now and we don't brush it all under the carpet. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't start getting better till you reach out and but really understanding yeah. your mental health. It's, it's key. Do you know when I when I I used to be an well I was an HR manager um, a few years back now maybe eight nine years ago and my job was to go in and support and help and um, a lot of my job as well was to you know go in and discipline people and do that kind of thing but I was always fascinated to see how the managers were so quick to blame people and so quick to point the finger and get them disciplined and get them out the door. And there was always, I remember there was this one case where there was this young man who, and it made me really think, never, ever, ever assume that someone's just okay on the surface. Yeah. And, and this, this young man, he had been late for work every single, just say it was a Wednesday, and he was late for work every single Wednesday. And there was nothing anybody could say to him that would ever change that he was just always late on a wednesday so it got to the point where they were disciplining him and i'd went in as the hr manager and sat with this young man and it was to the point now where we were going to dismiss him and i'd said to him i was like do you want to come out for a wee chat with me just like off the record come on out for a wee chat and i said to him i was like are you okay yeah. And I just very just stayed very silent. I was like, are you okay? And he got really upset and he told me that his wife had died in childbirth. And that a Wednesday was the only day where he could not get someone to look after the baby. Oh my word, Stephen. But he felt that he could not approach his manager because they just wouldn't understand. Oh my word. I know, it's crazy, right? And I tell people this story all the time. So I went back into that room and spoke to the area manager and the manager and I says, we are not dismissing this boy. We are going to support this boy and help him get back to exactly where he needs to be. Yeah. So what are we going to do to support him? <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. But I'm thinking if he's one person, right, mm -hmm. it's maybe quite an extreme case, how many other people feel like they cannot approach a person that should be supporting them in the workplace? Yeah. Which is their line manager. And yeah. Fear. You know, um, anyway, I'm going off on one, but like, <laughs> to me. That's, yeah, that's a perfect example, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, my goodness. And he was only 18. He was 18 years old and he, well, it wasn't his wife, it was his girlfriend or his yeah. partner or whatever, you know, she'd had a terrible pregnancy. She delivered the baby and she had a massive hemorrhage and died. And that poor lad could not speak to his boss. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. But again... You know, we were talking about the NHS and the third sector and how things we don't tap into the third sector. Mm -hmm. He must have had the only definite people he's had contact with are people from the NHS. Yeah. Now, it, it blows my mind that somebody hasn't said to this young lad, look, you've been through, this is just horrendous. We want to engage you and we want to tap you into some support in the community. Yeah. Um, 
I think to be fair, this was about 15 years ago, but yeah. at the time, I know that things were very different. You know, there wasn't the same Absolutely. support as we have now. Um, yeah. yeah. But I, I think it goes back to the fundamentals of, you know, like if managers are working with people and let's support you and let's help you up and let's train you, um, let's find solutions rather yeah. than let's. Because I, I think, and Richard would probably um, be able to give you a bit more of the, the latest information on this, because I have not been in that, that field for a long time, but um, Richard actually works with companies helping and supporting them um, with their workforces. So you and Richard could actually tie in and do a bit of work together, I believe. Um, but I think it's all very much, you know, if we can, because we spend half our lives at work, if we can help and support people at work with their mental well-being, then what a different world we would be living in. Absolutely. Honestly, it blows my mind that you have workplaces where you've, you've got an employee and they've worked with you for eight years and they've you know, being the person who's in there at 10 a and they've got the kettle on and they're all set up never late, productivity, everything. And then something happens. And I think this is where we go wrong as well, I've got to say. Um, someday, I don't know, a bereavement or a divorce or something happens to that person. And they start getting in a bit later, their work starts to suffer. And a boss is going to reprimand that person. It's like there's a significant change in someone's behaviour. There's yeah. something going on there. And in my in the training I'm delivering now, I very much say yes. A lot of this we have to focus on what are the signs and symptoms of various mental health challenges and conditions and all of that. I think what we need to focus on more, and I think what each are departments need to focus on more is actually the risk factors mm -hmm. so you know risk factors are bereavement divorce um becoming a long-term carer you know having a, a physical challenge now people in hr are going to know about that mm -hmm. probably now for me, it would be really nice to kind of be pre-prepared and have some leaflets and resources that when that happens to your employee, get them the support, then direct them to various um, support services then. Because if we do that, the chances are it's not going to escalate into a real issue. Whereas you know, you know, for example, you know the guy who's is divorced for his wife, he's had to leave the family home, he's, he's scrabbled around and got a, a room in somebody's house, he started drinking because he doesn't have that family structure anymore, he's drinking, spiralling out of control, whereas, and then he's getting late for work, he's making mistakes, but before that, that guy's worked for you for 10 years, and has been an amazing employee. Mm -hmm. So instead of waiting when these significant um, life events happen to people who are your employee, as soon as that life event happens, I think we could be doing more to support that person and get that person tapped into various um, support services that, that can help them to stop them going down that slippery slope in the first place. I think something as simple as just being there for someone, you know, like a good example of it is when I when I worked with big teams of people, I would recognize when people weren't right and I would say to them, you know, I would I would approach them in places like the canteen or Yes. You know, um, at their desk and say, are you okay? You know, yeah. rather than come into the office and let me have a word with you. 
which is absolutely the first step of a mental health first aider. You know, and there are people like you, Steve, and I like a lot of people who will naturally have a natural ability to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, but it's about getting more of us comfortable with doing that and confident to do it as well. Yeah, I, I, I was um, last last year, I was lucky enough. I went out and um, I'd done a law of attraction course with people. And the law of attraction course that I deliver, it's very different to what people think it is because it's more about like, how you have conversations with people and how you how you can you know I call it the leaf approach and um, the ego states model so we work with these two things and how you can help and support each other and help help and support each other in life just being a normal human being that talks and says what they feel and mm -hmm. um, anyway I'm not going to go into it all but from that I had a lady who attended that course and she'd said I would love you to come into my workplace and do a wee bit of work so I went in as a cleaner <laughs> on a day um, and I was just helping the cleaners just going around and helping the cleaners um, and it was only for like a couple of hours and um, from that I then went to to speak to the manager and the manager had said so what did you pick up and I was like well just going around with the cleaners and I, I wasn't like cleaning I was like you know spending a bit of time with them anyway shadowing, shadowing the cleaner yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I would have I would have happily but yeah. when I went to the manager he's like so what did you notice and I was like well I noticed that you're not working with your team yeah. I noticed that you spend your whole day in the office and you, you don't speak to people when you come out you, take, you get a coffee you go back into your office you're unapproachable your team's suffering because you are not there you're not leading your team and he was shocked yeah. he was completely blown away he's like I don't believe that it's my fault and I was like I believe it is your fault <laughs> Um, I believe that it's you that's causing the problems in your whole team um, and she having a really honest conversation with him and then having a really honest conversation with him see his whole workforce pulled together mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've not had a chance to go back and do more stuff with them but um, that was just in a, in a three hour afternoon you know yeah and, and it's true you said earlier Stephen you know a lot of us spend more time with our colleagues than we do with our family yeah. Um, so is it not in everybody's best interest to have a decent working environment and somewhere that, as I say, if, if somebody feels that they will be supported at work, that's going to be a, you know, a go-to. Mm -hmm. um, I know Apex Hotels, they did a whole series of training with um, a friend and colleague of mine and I think after a year, they actually they had monitored and evaluated it, and they had reduced the time that people would take off by two days. That's now that's that's huge. Yeah. Um. You know, if you've got a hundred employees, and you're saving two days, um, and and the working days lost is just. I don't even I, I'm no I don't even know if I want to actually see the statistics for 2020, 2019 and 20. Um so and you know a little investment can really go a, a long way. Um and that just that time, but I go back to empathy, kindness, understanding, um goes a long, long way. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, if you've got two members of staff or two members of a team off sick in a week, mm -hmm. even yeah. statutory sick pay is, what, £92 or something like that a week yeah. now, um, there's 188 quid a week. Oh, Stephen, April's off. I was just being in a quick wave. I just <laughs> caught it at the side. Sorry. £188 yeah. roughly a week 
which has then cost them a business over what a year 188 times 52 ten thousand pounds mm-hmm. and that's yeah. two people being off and so if we could change that and turn that into something different think yeah. of the savings that a company could be making absolutely and you're having a positive impact on that person absolutely and that, that positive impact will then be evident at home evident in other places because it's all work life you know they go on about work life balance um, and it's very easy as well for employers to kind of say oh well the she's having problems at home so it's all that you know and it's like well maybe she's having problems at home because things aren't right at work yeah um and vice versa again it's, it's like the whole parity of esteem isn't it we physical and mental health for me parity of esteem with home and work because one's going to have a negative impact on the other or positive so if you're unhappy at work you're almost definitely going to take that to home yeah um yeah. And vice versa if you're unhappy at home you're definitely going to take that to work so uh, yeah. we did speak about this forever june eh? I, know. Like... <laughs> I know sorry no not at all i think if anybody's got any questions or whatever i'm struggling to keep up with the chat i've got to say sorry Me too. i've been trying my best it's really hard speaking to you and trying to um <laughs> It's multitasking online. I, th- I think, um, yeah, I think, I think everything that they're they're saying there is pretty much what we're talking about anyway. Um, yeah. But I think, I think for anybody who is maybe new to mental health first aid or hasn't heard of it before. I think to to kind of summarise what you've said today, June, it's very much about like, you know, when someone goes and breaks a bone, you can see that, you can fix that, you can help it and you can treat it acutely. When it comes to mental well-being, it's a very different thing. Yes. So what would your, how would you um, summarise what mental health first aid is? Oh, I, for me, it is uh, early intervention and prevention tool. Um, and it's about people being confident and comfortable when they recognise that someone's in distress and they recognise the signs and symptoms of initiating a conversation. Yeah. And, it's, and it's actually, there's a lot of learning about listening you know, listening skills and responding to that person with care, empathy, understanding and helping them and directing them and empowering them to engage with appropriate professionals and appropriate support services. Um, Actually, one of the biggest things that people don't do is listen. And it's the one of the biggest things that I find myself training people as well is like, stop and listen see your pen put your pen in your mouth mm-hmm. <laughs> ask a question an enabling question and stick your pen in your mouth if you can keep your mouth shut stick your pen in your mouth are you okay because <laughs> yeah. people naturally want to fix whereas if people can recognize how they're feeling by silence from the other person it's massive isn't it yeah absolutely and Richard, I'm, I'm going to be running an open course probably mid-January. Um, I'm, and I'm also, I'll be running some funded courses. Um, but it's particular demographics. It's men, um, LGBT plus, and the disabled community. Um, we're looking for volunteers and community practitioners from the, those demographics. So there'll be some funded courses coming up as well. Um, and again, we do in-house courses, open courses, we're doing or we've had to adapt to online, um, which has been a challenge, but we've got there. Uh, so, yeah. And if you, anybody needs any other information, don't hesitate to get in touch. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, June. So that's us at 10.33. I could honestly, can we put another couple of hours on the clock and nobody will know? <laughs> <laughs> but we could, we could speak about it for ages. Um, yeah. So yeah. very quickly, anybody got anything else they want to ask before we go? Oh, Gina would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Richard, honestly, if you want to have a wee chat another time, please just get in touch. Um, but thanks a lot. And sorry that if we've not covered everything that was in the chat. Um, no, I think I think you and Richard would definitely add value to each other. What, what, what Richard's doing with um, workplaces and, and that kind of thing, I think that you two working together and having a wee nice warm contact with each other would be really good. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's us for today. Um, our you. very last Soul Man surgery is tomorrow. Um, uh -huh. It is with Susan Watson. And tomorrow, Susan is talking about a topic that I do not know because I have not read my message from her yet so I'll share that later um, but it'll all be about trauma and, and dealing with anxiety and all of that kind of stuff um, which is really good. Yeah. It, it, as we come to a close I just want to say a huge big thank you to the lovely June for today um, and I'm sorry June that there was so much thrown at you there we're like ah! <laughs> loads of information um, it's fine honestly and if anybody wants to have a chat in general um, we are very much about working together in co-production and sharing resources knowledge whatever because I think that's the only way to go yeah. now you know we need to all work together and do what we can brilliant um, Richard saying thanks June really good to meet you we'll ping you a message you too, Richard. We better <laughs> let you go before. <laughs> better let Richard go before he gets any bother. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, and thank you, June. Thank and, you. Um, we shall see you all later. Yes. Take care. And June, are you okay just to hang on for just two seconds, and yes. we can just you and I can just have a wee. Yeah. Fab. I'm just going to.